I'm Howie Schneider. I'm the, the dean of the School of Journalism uh, at Stony Brook, and I want to welcome you to the latest edition of a special lecture series we call My Life As, that brings to Stony Brook some of the most notable journalists in the country. In the past decade, we've brought more than 50 guests here, many winners of Pulitzer Prizes, recipients of Emmy Awards, but tonight I think our guest may be unique in the following way. She not only covered and commented on the news for the past several decades, she became the news. In July of 2016, when she filed a sexual harassment suit against arguably the man who was the most powerful figure in American media, and that was Fox Chairman Roger Ailes. Um, we're going to talk to Gretchen Carlson tonight about what her life has been like since that suit. We're going to talk to her a little bit about the future and her observations. And to do that, to facilitate this conversation, we are going to have someone else join her on stage who is an accomplished media executive herself. Marcy McGinnis, the former vice president of CBS News, senior vice president C C at CBS. And to many of us, or at least some of us here from the journalism school, more importantly, Marcy was the associate dean of the School of Journalism between 2006 and 2013 and helped build this school, for which I am forever grateful, as many of our faculty and our students are. So in a minute, I'm going to ask Marcy to come up here and really do our guests some justice in terms of introducing her. But let me tell you how the evening is going to unfold. Marcy will tell you a lot more about Gretchen Carlson. Marcy worked with her at CBS. Then Marcy and Gretchen will have a conversation. We will then throw it open to all of you to ask any question you want. And then following the program, Gretchen will be available in the lobby. If you'd like to meet her, she'll be signing books, and if you'd like to buy one of her books, her latest book is called Be Fierce, and we'll talk about it. It's obviously the product of what happened to her and what's unfolded since that suit. So that will happen at the conclusion of the program. With that, please join with me in welcoming back to Stony Brook, Marcy McGinnis. Could have at least lowered the microphone for me. <laughs> Thank you, Howie. Thanks, everybody. So, imagine, if you will, that you are seven years old and you can already play box concerto in A minor on your violin. After all, you've been learning to play the instrument since you were six. Now imagine that you're 10 and you've been asked to play for Isaac Stern. So naturally, you pick the first movement of Mozart's concerto in G. No sweat, it's just what you do. It's just what you love. At least it's what Gretchen Carlson loved. By the time Gretchen was in the eighth grade, this violin prodigy was playing solos with two professional orchestras in her hometown of, Min of <clears throat> in her home state of Minnesota. Music wasn't her only accomplishment. Gretchen had academic chops as well. She graduated from high school in 1984 at the top of her class. She went on to graduate from Stanford University after taking a year abroad to study at Oxford University in England. And oh yeah, there was this other stop along the way called the Miss America pageant, which she won in 1989 with, you guessed it, a stellar performance with the violin in the talent competition. Though she loved music and her talent as a violinist was certainly strong enough to support a career, Gretchen decided during her year on the road as Miss America that she was going to pursue a career in broadcast news. Carving out a path in television news is not easy, but Gretchen was determined to get there. 
During her reign as Miss America, when she was beginning her search for a job in television, Gretchen sought out people for advice on how to get in the business, how to do it right. It was during this time that Gretchen had her first real encounter with sexual harassment, and she was only 22. We'll hear more about that from Gretchen herself. Gretchen continued her job search. The big networks never hire someone for on-air work who has no on-air experience. They want someone more seasoned. They want reporters who have worked their way up from smaller markets to the bigger markets before hitting the network scene. So that's what Gretchen did. She landed her first job in Richmond, Virginia, where one of her first stories was covering, strangely, Anita Hill's accusations of sexual harassment against Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. She also worked the local crime beat, not an easy beat for anyone who knows the seedy side of news. And speaking of seedy, one of Gretchen's first encounters with workplace sexual harassment occurred when her cameraman brazenly asked her, how do you like it when I put that microphone under your shirt? I was touching your breasts when I put that microphone on, you know. Ugh. After Richmond, Gretchen went to Cincinnati, where she cut her teeth on long form and investigative stories. And it was here that she also learned the skills of doing live TV, skills that would serve her well in the future. Her next stop was Cleveland, where she became part of a great experiment, two female anchors for the evening news broadcasts. Unfortunately, the experiment did not work out. Cleveland wasn't quite ready for an all-female anchor team, and neither was station management. Gretchen saw the writing on the wall when the night she wore pink and her co-anchor wore orange on the air. The station manager called and complained that it looked like a pumpkin had exploded in a raspberry field. Well, she figured it was time to move on anyway. Gretchen spent the next two years in Dallas as a reporter for the, CBS, for the NBC affiliate, where she covered stories that included Columbine, the dragging murder of James Byrd, and her fair share of tornadoes. And though she loved working in Dallas, Gretchen could not resist when CBS News called with an offer to move to New York. I was part of the management team that recognized Gretchen had what it took to succeed. A strong broadcaster, reporter, and writer, Gretchen covered national stories for CBS that included the 2000 Bush-Gore presidential election and the attacks on 9-11. In 2002, we named her co-anchor of the Saturday early, early show. National recognition followed, and others began to notice. Fox News came after Gretchen with an offer she couldn't refuse to work on one of their signature shows, Fox and Friends. She started as the weekend substitute host, but by 2006 became co-host with Steve Ducey and Brian Kilmeade of the, at, the higher, <clears throat> at the higher profile weekday slot. She stayed there for seven years until 2013. The years hosting with Steve and Brian had its ups and downs. On the air, even with the occasional jabs to each other, it looked like the hosts may have been having a lot of fun. But Gretchen alleges that their workplace resembled more of a locker room than a newsroom. Finally, she had enough, and she went to the boss to complain. Roger Ailes was not a sympathetic ear. Instead of offering to do something about her situation, he called her a man-hater and told her she should, quote, try and get along with the boys. Not long after that meeting, Ailes demoted Gretchen, moving her off the morning show to a less desirable time slot in the afternoon. She stayed three years hosting her show, The Real Story with Gretchen Carlson, until June of 2016. That's when Ailes abruptly fired her. Two weeks later, she shot back with an explosive lawsuit. The lawsuit included evidence she had been quietly gathering and was thought to include audio of meetings with Ailes that she recorded on her iPhone. Her lawsuit alleged that she was fired for refusing Ailes' sexual advances. In her complaint, Gretchen says Ailes began sexually harassing her shortly after she complained about her co-host, Steve Ducey. She said in the complaint that Ailes began making comments in one-on-one -on -one meetings, like, 
I think you and I should have had a sexual relationship a long time ago. And sometimes, you know, problems are easier to solve that way. Her lawsuit claimed it was when she rejected his advances that Ailes retaliated, sabotaged her career, and eventually fired her. The earthquake that Gretchen started by filing her lawsuit against Roger Ailes, arguably the most powerful man in television news, was off the charts. Initially, Fox personalities, including Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, Britt Hume, Geraldo Rivera, and Greta Van Susteren all lined up to back the boss. But when parent company 21st Century Fox launched, launched an internal investigation, the floodgates opened. Dozens of women came forward with strikingly similar stories about Ailes. And when the highest profile female anchor currently at Fox News, Megyn Kelly, said on Good Morning America that Ailes had sexually harassed her, trying to kiss her three times in his office, it was all over. In the space of just two weeks, facing overwhelming public criticism, Ailes resigned. And on September 6, 2016, just two months after filing her lawsuit, 21st Century Fox reached a settlement with Gretchen that included a rare public apology and a $20 million payout. <laughs> Named one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world, Gretchen was also recently honored at the First Amendment Awards in Washington, D.C. for her perseverance in the face of adversity and dedication to bringing the truth to light. She also serves as the first female chair of the Miss America organization. Additionally, Gretchen is working with members of Congress to get a bipartisan bill passed that would put an end to the use of forced arbitration clauses in employment contracts. She has also created the Gift of Courage Fund, which focuses on helping girls and young women recognize their full potential. And her Gretchen Carlson Leadership Initiative brings civic leadership and advocacy training to thousands of underserved women across the country. Gretchen's newest book, Be Fierce, Stop Sexual Harassment and Take Your Power Back, is filled with practical advice and inspiration. In addition to everything else she's doing, Gretchen's primary focus remains her family, daughter Kaya, son Christian, and her husband of 20 years, Casey Close. Please join me in welcoming Gretchen Clausen to the stage. Thank you so much, Marcy, and thank you all for coming out on a, another miserable night, right? <laughs> What's going on? But uh, I was just in Miami earlier this morning. It was much nicer there, but I broke out my boots to, uh, to come back here to New York. Uh, thank you again, Marcy. Um, really appreciative and loved my time at CBS News. Um, had a great experience there. And Randall Pinkston's here, who was a fellow correspondent with me, and our offices were on the same floor, so great to see you as well, Randall. Thanks, thanks for being here. Um, wow, I mean, you put a lot of time and effort into that, so thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Uh, Marcy said a lot of things that I can't publicly say. <laughs> um, so you get the gist of, of what, was, what was going on. So let's, let's, um, let me ask a question. I alluded to, um, before you were even working, you were, you were uh, Miss America, you were on, your, on the, uh, the road, and, but you were beginning to look for broadcast jobs. And I mentioned in there that was where you, when you had your first sexual harassment situation. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. Yeah, so actually, um, I have just come to terms with the fact in writing my latest book that it was actually sexual assault. Um, this is what happens to women. We push these kinds of experiences down. We don't even label them what they really are. So I actually had two assaults on me within a period of two weeks, both by high-ranking men in the television and PR business. 
So I thought I was doing the right thing by cold calling to try to break into TV. I didn't realize it also meant somebody trying to get into my pants. Uh, but that's what uh, ended up. I was with a high-ranking um, television network executive. He spent almost the whole day with me making a lot of phone calls. And I thought, wow, he really is interested in my smarts and my, <laughs> and my talent. Um, and we went to dinner, which was innocuous, and we were in the back seat of a car service uh, going back to my friend's apartment when all of a sudden he was on top of me and his tongue was down my throat. And I just had this panicked reaction, like, I've got to escape. Um, so I screamed for the driver to pull over, and I was able to barrel my way out of, out of the car. I got up to my friend's apartment and, of course, just lost it, because this is what happens to women. You, you're like, well, what did I do? What did I do to bring this on? You know, and I felt responsibility, and I never, ever told anyone what happened to me for 25 years until I wrote my memoir uh, two years ago, and I'd never called that sexual assault until I was writing my latest book, Be Fierce. Actually, when one of President Trump's accusers, I was interviewing her, for my book, and, and I was telling her this story, and she said, you realize that was assault, right? And I said, no. She said, Gretchen, that's assault. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess it is, you know? A couple of weeks later in LA, same thing happened with a PR executive, unfortunately again in a car, and he took my head in his, uh, my neck in his hand, just immediately when we got into the car together, and pushed my head so far down into his crotch, I couldn't breathe. And um, again, I managed to escape out of the car, uh, but never told anybody. And um, it goes to show you how horrible these kinds of experiences in women's lives stay with you for your whole life, because 25 years later, when I was at Fox in my office, uh, I saw this man walk past my office in the hallway, and I went into panic mode, like PTSD. And I was like a seven-year-old little girl in my office again. And I went and slammed the door, and I thought, oh, how, how am I going to get out of here? You know, I don't want to see this man. And so I was peering out from my own office, <laughs> making sure that the coast was clear, and I was sweating and um, back in that moment of what he had done to me. So. I think it, it, it proves how horrible these experiences are for women in their lives and how long they can stay with you and I think how we've been sort of socialized and programmed to push them out of the way. And not only that, we've been programmed to blame ourselves. Totally. Like, was I flirting? Was I suggestive? What did I do? Not the, this guy was a total jerk or worse, mm -hmm. but what is it about blaming ourselves? Well, I think because we're certainly not socialized to speak up until now, but we're not because we, we've um, bought into the myths that exist out there that, well, we'll just be blamed anyway, right? We'll, we'll be labeled as a troublemaker and nobody will believe us, right? He said, she said. And so why even go down that path? It's just easier to stuff it down and, and get past it. I think women are also socialized to um, work harder and think that the harder we work, the more these problems will just go away. And the problem with harassment is that no matter how hard you work to show somebody that you're smart, they're never going to see you for what you really are. And I know that my own personal experience was I just kept working harder and harder and harder. And that doesn't cure harassment. Um, and so I think we just we need to change our mindset. Now we're starting to see that in what I like to call this cultural revolution. We're starting to see where uh, women are actually being believed. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> and so much has changed from just the time when I jumped off the cliff on July 6, 2016, till the more recent the me high profile media stories and, mm -hmm. and Me Too where uh, men were, were fired immediately and, and women were, for the most part, believed. And, uh, and there were consequences that, that were immediate. 
I mean, nobody could have ever predicted that we would have come that far in this revolution because cultural change takes forever. But you know what? You brought down an un, the most powerful man in television or in media, period. So I think that this was no small thing. I think when women saw that, the idea, I mean, I knew Roger Ailes. He, he was a scary guy. <laughs> He was a scary guy and an unbelievably powerful guy. And the idea that, you know, I love it, this diminutive little blonde, you know, is the one that gets him, <laughs> you know? And so the fact that you brought him down started this earthquake and started this tsunami. And what do you think about the Harvey Weinstein um, situation. Would, do you believe that that would not have happened had it not been for you? Uh, yes, I, I believe that, yeah, I don't, I don't think we would know anything about that. He'd still be so it doing those year. horrible things. It took a year for that to come out. What, what was going on in that year from when you jumped off the cliff to when all these other women started to come forward? Mm -hmm. So I think with my story, women and men saw that there was, uh, there was a consequence. And I started hearing from thousands of women, well it started as dozens, and then hundreds of women that were sharing their own personal stories with me of, of harassment. Um, and, and my good Midwestern sensibilities from growing up in Minnesota where my parents always told me I had to write thank you notes to everyone, uh, I, I started responding to all these women. You know, uh, that's how I've always been. And I got into the thousands and I was printing off all these stories in my home office and I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, how am I going to continue to do this? But more importantly, how am I going to tell these women's stories? And they told me two things that were sort of the same which was, thank you for being a voice for the voiceless. And I have never worked again in my chosen profession. Those were, the, those were the sad realities. But they felt also a sense of victory through my story, because they had never received any sort of victory in their cases. But they felt like they could live vicariously through what they saw as, as a victory because of consequence. Mm -hmm. So then if you fast forward, I think other women and men who were victims and living through this in their lives, they thought, well, maybe I can speak up too because maybe I'll be believed because this woman was believed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's why for me, the most important part of coming to any sort of a settlement or terms was the apology. That never happens, ever. That was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you all know how extraordinary it is to get a public apology from a, from a major corporation mm -hmm. for sexual harassment, mm -hmm. but you got that. That was part of your settlement deal. Mm -hmm. And the, the day that that news came trickling out, of all things, I was in New York City, and uh, the, it wasn't supposed to be the day of the announcement, so I had a haircut appointment and then I got into the city early because it was the first day of school and my husband and I always take our children to school on the first day and then we would drive into the city except now I wasn't going to work, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, I had a haircut appointment. I was early so I went into a nail salon. Well nobody in New York City gets their nails done at 9 a.m. So there I am all by myself <laughs> um, and the news started coming out earlier than it was supposed to and I was on my phone and tears were just coming down my face. Um, not because of the settlement, but because of the way in which the media was reacting to the apology. And that was really the headline, that they were really saying, I can't believe she got this apology. And to me, that was just so important and, and, and such a vindication. And how about um, all those people that pretty much attacked you and stood by Ailes in the beginning. They slowly but surely began to apologize to you, didn't they? Some of them. Mm. <laughs> or not so much. Mm -hmm. Two. No. Two? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about this whole um, arbitration and the fact that, that you told me we, you can't talk about Fox. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about uh, the network. It's part of the settlement deal. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you know, these kinds of deals. Like the whole reason, 
you know, you won this thing is to give voice, mm -hmm. and here you are muzzled, not allowed to talk. Yeah, but I can talk about the issue. That was another huge thing, is that I, I've had the ability to talk about this all across the country and the world, you know, and, and work on it from so many different angles. So, yes, there is a certain amount of, of silence um, and muzzling of women. I think I was describing to you that the way in which we as a society have deemed okay to solve these kinds of cases, they're both secret. Settlements where the woman can never tell you what happened, and arbitration, which is a secret chamber. So I'm going to ask the audience, uh, for people who are working and have an employment contract, do you know if you have an arbitration clause in your contract? Do you know what one is? This is usually when we get like the glaze factor, but you should know if you have one. I, I know that I had no idea what it meant, uh, but it's, it's a dark day when you find out you have one because it means that you've given up your Seventh Amendment right to an open jury process. And these uh, arbitration clauses have become prevalent for U.S. employees. They've doubled since the year 2000. 60 million Americans have them in their contracts. So what they do is that they, they settle disputes at work in this secret chamber. It was never intended for discrimination cases and harassment cases. When the Supreme Court ruled on this more than 20 years ago, it was a way to unclog the court system from small business disputes, but not human rights violations. But that's how it's been used in corporations. So they're secret. A woman complains, let's say she has an arbitration clause. She complains about sexual harassment, she immediately gets thrown into arbitration. The company goes, Phew, nobody will ever know about this. Then she goes into this chamber where many times the company picks the arbitrator for you. You don't get the same amount of witnesses or depositions. There are no appeals. Only 20% of the time does the employee actually win. And she can never, ever tell anyone what happened to her. Now she's out of work. She may have gotten some sort of a paltry settlement in arbitration. And the perpetrator gets to stay on the job and nobody ever knows about it. So then nobody else in that same workplace knows that the behavior is going on. They feel like they might be all alone because nobody can talk about it. And this is why I think the movement has gained so much steam because the American public, when they started seeing these allegations and horrific stories from Weinstein on down, I think that Americans were horrified to think that this kind of behavior was still happening in the workplace. Because they were thinking, well, we don't really hear about these stories. The reason you're not hearing about them is because they're going to secret chambers. And so we've really been fooling the American public into thinking that we had come so far for women. And we really hadn't and haven't. So I've been walking the hallways of Capitol Hill for <laughs> the last year and a half. And in December, as you mentioned, I was very proud to introduce a bipartisan bill, imagine that, uh, in the House and the Senate on the same day to end arbitration. Give women and men at least a choice if they want to go to this secret chamber. Now we have to get it passed. But wouldn't it be amazing if uh, we could actually get something done on the Hill for women? So, so what reason could anyone possibly have for not wanting this to pass. I know. So this is what I say when I meet with the politicians, uh, who, by the way, if they're men, they promptly tell me about how their wife has been sexually harassed and how uh, their, their daughter, they don't want this for their kids. And I say, well, that's exactly right. And sexual harassment's apolitical, and this is why everyone should care about it. Uh, but I think that there are so many lobbying forces out there, like uh, the Chamber of Commerce and um, uh, other you know, big companies that don't want to potentially open themselves up to their dirty laundry and to more litigation. Um, but I'm very, I'm very hopeful. I, I wanted it to be a bipartisan bill because there's no way in hell that it would pass if it's not. And um, so I continue my efforts. I mean, I'll, I'll be back in D.C. In, in the next couple of weeks and I have a series of meetings set up to try and get more people on board. The more people I can get to sponsor the bill now, the more chance it has to pass. And then we have to get President Trump to sign it. Whoa. <laughs> so, uh, but I have a strategy for that too. <laughs> I'm not going to share it. <laughs> but I do have a, a strategy for, for that. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Might have to be down there to watch that. <laughs> I'll um, let you know. You know, meanwhile, um, there's women all over the country in all sorts of 
of um, jobs that aren't high profile. They're not TV anchors and they're not actresses um, dealing with, you know, the likes of a Harvey Weinstein. They're regular mm -hmm. women in, a, in the food industry, you know, any industry. And they're still suffering from this. What, what's the kind of advice you have for them or what, what's the hope that they have? So that's the every woman story. Uh, and those are predominantly the women that I heard from. And even I didn't realize how pervasive this epidemic is. It crosses every socioeconomic line. It crosses every profession from waitresses to assistants to sports executives to attorneys to teachers to members of our military. It, it just every single profession. And one of the most painstaking questions that I got after my case broke was, how do you help the single mom working two jobs who can't literally afford to come forward because she's, you know, she's also being harassed? And I had a lot of sleepless nights over that because I didn't have an answer for it. So that's how I created the Gretchen Carlson Leadership Initiative, through my fund. It's the largest grant that I've given because I wanted to start at least a beginning step to help those women. Uh, so it's a nine city tour. We've done three cities already. It's three days of workshops in each city where underserved women can come for free and learn uh, about legal advice, uh, about domestic violence if that's what they're facing, how to have a voice civically and politically. Because many times when you're going through things like this, you feel like your voice doesn't matter on anything. And I want them to know that it does. And I have to tell you that um, you know, it's not necessarily going to change the world in just one year, but, but it's a beginning. And in every city that we've been to so far, we have had at least one woman who in the beginning doesn't think her voice matters and by the end of day three is standing up and saying, I'm running for political office. <laughs> so I'm very, it's, it's probably my most proud accomplishment over the last 21 months uh, because it is so important to honor the women who don't have the resources mm -hmm. to do what I did. And it's also my hope that the media will continue to cover the stories. Uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times have done stories mm -hmm. on food workers, hospital workers, mm -hmm. uh, women who work at auto plants. Mm -hmm. um, and all these women are still reaching out to me, and I say to them, go to your local press. Because if there was ever a time that any member of the media would be interested in covering your story, it's now. Mm -hmm. you know, whole divisions of, of magazines and newspapers are dedicating staff just to covering this movement, which we could have never predicted. I mean, all the years that we've been in the business, the idea that you would have an entire uh, group of people dedicated to covering mm -hmm. sexual and harassment. Winning Pulitzer Prize. And winning, I mean, they just announced all those yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It was amazing. So we train women, we have workshops for women, we give women voices. How do we change the men? <laughs> um, I mean, they're so, the ones doing this. I know, I, and it's such, a, it's such a fantastic question. And again, another unexpected thing that happened to me in this whole experience, which has been all unexpected, was that tons of men reached out to me too after my story broke. And that was incredibly surprising to me. In my unscientific study of walking the streets of New York City, more men than women actually stop me. And they want to shake my hand. And you know what they say to me? Thank you for my daughters. And I started to realize, as more and more men reached out to me, that there are a ton of men out there who are doing great things to help promote women. Mm -hmm. And I ended up wanting to feature them in my book because I wanted to celebrate their efforts. It turns out that the majority of men actually want safe work environments for women. It's these random jerks we have to get rid of. But the majority of men actually want to help. They may just not know how to. So Men Who Defend in my book became my longest chapter because there were so many men I wanted to celebrate. So in a nutshell, uh, fixing sexual harassment is a tangled web. It's not just one thing. It's the way we raise our children. It's laws. It's policies that we have in place. It's sexual harassment training. But one of the huge keys, I think, to really fully experiencing this tipping point that we're witnessing right now in our society is when men decide to stop being enablers and bystanders on this issue and become allies for women. And I know that it takes the same amount of courage
for a man to speak up for a woman, as even the woman coming forward with her own claims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we must encourage men to do that. Because when you, when you don't, it becomes the norm of your workplace culture. If you don't say something, it just gets worse and it escalates and it becomes normal. Imagine if a man would say to an offender, don't you ever speak like that ever again to my colleague. It stops it cold. Mm -hmm. Imagine if Billy Bush would have said that mm -hmm. on the bus. I mean, it would have taken immense courage. But it would have stopped it, at least in that instant, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a pure example of, of how you can change the situation, you know, very simply. Now, it's much more complicated than that inside the confines of a workplace structure. But um, I think men are crucial to really fully seeing the end of this revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let the record show that most men, as you mentioned, most men are not, you know, running around the office demanding sex, women. right? But most of them aren't. <laughs> I mean, most, most are, are, you know, the gentlemen that they should be. However, um, you know, we have all suffered at the hands of these mm -hmm. jerks. Um, and, and some men, I document in my book, some men who actually came forward on behalf of women because they were being harassed, guess what happened to those men? They were promptly mm -hmm. demoted, blacklisted, and fired. So it's amazing the lengths to which we will go in our society to protect harassers. It's unbelievable. And we were talking about this earlier. Tell your Joe story. Oh, yeah. So, so it's not just, I think there's this myth in society that it's only the, the huge money makers and companies that... Uh, companies try to save when they're harassers, right? But it turns out that it's actually the low-level employees, too. So one of the stories in my book, and I'm going to try and keep it anonymous because I don't want to uh, out this particular person, but um, she was warned when she started her job, and she was in the prime of her career, you know, watch out for Joe. Joe's pretty handsy. And, sure, and it was just like it was an accepted fact. Joe had been there 30 years, low-level employee. Sure enough, Joe was handsy, and she was the victim in his handsiness, and even when she was pregnant. And so she did exactly what women shouldn't do, and it's why chapter four in my book is my 12-point plan for women, because you've got to have a plan. She didn't have a plan. Again, women think we can handle this, we'll just work harder. One day she finally just can't take it anymore, she goes to HR and complains. Then you can't put the genie back in the bottle. No plan. So what happens to her? She's in the prime of her career, she's a star. Guess what? She gets a very short contract extension, suddenly the tide changes completely against her. She's suddenly not getting the plum assignments anymore, so she's promptly blacklisted, demoted, and fired. And Joe's still there. And she's labeled a troublemaker because she complained. Mm -hmm. And then if she goes to try and get a job at another network, at another station, at another place of employment, when they check the references, next thing you know, they're getting that kind of, oh, you know, she might sue you. You better watch out. And so, therefore... She's not working in the profession anymore. Right. Right. And I that's 99.9% that's .9 of all the women who've gone through this, I mean, that is outrageous. It's outrageous that we have stripped away the American dream from thousands and maybe millions of women in this country who work just as hard as anyone else to try to be the best they could be in their profession and something that they were passionate about and it was their dream. I mean, it's my life story. And it was completely taken away from them because they simply had the courage to come forward and say something wasn't right. We should all care about that. Mm -hmm. And what I've been advocating now, instead of, I hate it when uh, some well-known perpetrator falls, you know, <laughs> and then within the next week, I'll see on TV, the Chiron will be going across, when will that person be rehired again? And I'm like, <laughs> well, why are we talking about that? Like, are, are harassers rehabable, if that's even a word? We should be hiring back all the women who've lost their professions for simply having the courage to come forward. That's what companies should be focusing on. Right. So let me ask you something. Um, you were Miss America in 1989. Mm -hmm. Unexpectedly. 
unexpectedly. <laughs> uh, her mother's idea, by the way. Yes. She's, uh, you know, hanging out in Stanford, and your mother calls up and says, oh, I got an idea. Mm -hmm. Talent is worth 50% of this contest, and so she's got the talent, as we all know, mm -hmm. and um, proceeded to go the pageant route. Mm -hmm. So um, let me ask you this. Oh, by the way, Gretchen is now the uh, first female chair of the Miss America organization, and on the board um, are many former Miss Americas, mm -hmm. and uh, not on the board anymore are people who were the, was the former chair and uh, former board members who had been exchanging emails that were speaking uh, in a derogatory way about contestants, former contestants, uh, including you, mm -hmm. right? So you're there to try and help change this culture. Right. So here's my question, though. The Miss America pageant is still for beautiful, thin, albeit talented, but beautiful, thin women. Mm -hmm. So how do we... I'm going to take away all of your concerns. Oh. <laughs> um, well, here, here's, our, here's our first... First of all, I never expected to be in this position uh, either. It was basically a call to duty. Like, how could I have ever predicted that the same sort of a situation would happen with this organization? Uh, and so it, it's a volunteer job, by the way, which I have been spending an inordinate amount of time the last four months to get, wrap my arms around a complete organization um, and, and, and try and get a production in line for uh, the next couple of months. But... Two things. Uh, the messaging of the Miss America competition has never been right. Miss America is the competition that has a talent category and a competition that gives scholarship dollars for women to be able to go to college. The others don't have those two things. And so we get a high caliber of young woman who wants to enter the program. For example, I paid for my whole last year of Stanford with the scholarship money that, that I won. Um, I could tell you countless stories of hundreds and thousands of women who paid their entire way through college or law school or whatever um, based on being part of the program. So that needs to be messaged better. But at the same time, yeah, we have, we have to make it relevant for the 21st century. And I don't want to disclose uh, anything because uh, that will come in the very near future. But rest assured, I would not be bringing my entire Be Fierce movement to this organization unless... I was going to make it completely about empowerment and leadership for women. So um, it's a tremendous amount of work, but I think Marcy McGinnis is not going to be looking at me like that. <laughs> uh, when, I just when, want to know when we're done, when, a little overweight, when, when we're, or a lot overweight. So I'm going to tell you this: so it's going to be much more inclusive for uh, for all kinds of women, and. Um, I got to leave it there. But you're going to be, I, I'm going to call you up. And I'm, and, I'm going to call you yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're, I see women in bathing suits and high heels on yep. the stage, I'm calling you're, you're you gonna, up. You're going to call, you're gonna call <laughs> me up and I think you're going to be happy. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, about how you, um, you, you mentioned we have to change how we, uh, how we raise our sons mm -hmm. so that it starts young. How are you doing that with your son? Hmm. Thank you for asking. Uh, my children were my paramount concern in this whole process. Uh, they were 11 and 13 at the time. Uh, you know, very few people on this planet knew what I was about to do um, because I had to keep it that way. So my parents, who I'm still blessed to have in my life, uh, my husband, my lawyers, that was it. The night before, I told my children... And uh, that was very painful uh, because I was very worried about the impact that something like this would have on my kids. Um, a little bit of humor is that the first thing when I told them, mommy's been fired and um, this is what mommy's going to do tomorrow. And the first thing that came out of my son's mouth was, what's going to happen to Tara, our babysitter? <laughs> and I was like, I know mommy's really concerned about Tara too, but what about mommy? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they... They really, I underestimated the power of my own kids. And two quick stories. My, um, on the day that the resolution was announced, it was the first day of school, as I was saying. And I was very concerned about it. 
And my daughter came home from school that day and she said, Mom, she said, a lot of people asked me about what happened to you over the summer. And I said, yeah. And she said, and Mommy, I was so proud to be able to call you my mom. And a couple weeks later, there were some kids who'd been really making her life miserable and she hadn't had the courage to do anything about it. And she came home from school and she said, Mom, I have to tell you something. She said, I told this one that, and I told that one this. <laughs> and she said, Mommy, I did it because I saw you do it. Then my son, a couple months ago, I was on a CNN town hall with Anita Hill and others talking mm -hmm. about this issue. And I came home from out of town, and he was in the kitchen. His eyebrows were furrowed. And he was very concerned. He said, Mommy, is it true what that other woman on television said with you? And I said, what? And he said that once every 76 seconds or 73 seconds, a woman is sexually assaulted or harassed in our country. And I said, I'm so sorry to tell you that that is true. And he looked at me and he said, Mommy, I want to be a part of fixing that. And how old is he? He's 12. Wow. And I hugged him so hard and then he went back down in the basement and played PlayStation. And I went into my husband's office and I just lost it. And I said, this is what our son just said. And so if what I did has only impacted the lives of bringing courage and knowledge about being a better person to my two kids, then it was all worth it. But I know that it's been so much more than that. And what we really need to do is focus more on how we raise our sons, which brings me full circle to mm -hmm. your question. We categorize sexual harassment as a woman's issue, but it's really a man's issue. And in calling it only a woman's issue, it puts the responsibility of fixing it on the shoulders of women. And that's not fair, because we both, both genders need to work together to try and solve this. I think oftentimes when, when men hear about a woman's issue, they, not in a bad way, but they just go, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that because it's a woman's issue, mm -hmm. right? So we need to recategorize what we're, what we're calling this. That's the first thing. And we often think about, oh, we got to empower our girls. We got to tell them they can be whatever they want to be in life, which is what my mom said to me every day, and I'm grateful that I heard that. But we have so many empowerment organizations for girls. What we really need to be doing is raising our boys to respect girls and women when they eventually get into the workplace. That's where I should be spending 99.9% .9 of my time, is speaking to young men. And with my book, I've been doing a college campus tour. I've been very heartened to see so many young men come to my sessions. And a couple months ago, I spoke at an all-boys high school. And I never get nervous, but I was actually really nervous because I didn't know what the reception would be like. And it was awesome. And I didn't know if they'd ask any questions. And they had so many questions, we actually had to cut it off because they had to go back to class. And the teachers emailed me later and said, we're still talking about this a week later. So it really made an impact you know, and a difference. That's where I should be spending mm -hmm. the majority of my time because it's really about our sons. We need to shift the narrative in the way in which we look at this um, to, to really call it what it is, which is, sorry, predominantly a man's problem, and, and shift our focus to empower boys. What I told them was, to man up is not to be macho, it's to speak up. It's to speak up for women and to support your colleagues like you would support your sister or your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crucial. It's crucial that we get that messaging out to our young men. Mm -hmm. Okay, speaking of questions, we're going to take questions from the audience. We've got microphones set up at both sides here. If you just come to the microphone, please identify yourself and um, ask your question. Just tell us who you are. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Luis Sanchez. I'm a journalism student here at Stony Brook. And I just wanted to ask, currently with the Me Too movement occurring and President Trump, who is one of the most powerful men in the world, and dozens of women being accused, who have accused him, and nothing has been done. What would you tell these women um, who have been heard, and how should this all end? 
I get this question every single day. And, well, repeat the question. Oh, okay. So he was asking me about the accusations of sexual harassment against our own president and uh, that nothing's been done and, you know, how I would feel about, I think, empowering these women. Um, it's a frequent question. I did feature one of Trump's accusers in my book. Um, she was actually the one who let me know that it was assault that had happened to me. Um, so, in private companies, we can, we can fire people uh, based on bad behavior or sexual harassment revelations. But, you know, in the political world, really hiring and firing is done by the voters. And voters elected President Trump even knowing about these accusations. So, you know, they'll have to make that decision the, the next time around. Um, I do feel really bad for these women because it was as if their stories only existed for a nanosecond and then they, they kind of went back into oblivion. Um, it's why I wanted to feature one of them in my book. Um, I, I think it's interesting to note that I think it's one of the reasons why the president has supported other people who have been accused of similar activity because it keeps, you know, it keeps the, the theory going that some people are falsely accused. Mm -hmm. um, and just the other thing I'd say politically is that we can't pick and choose who we want to believe based on politics. So if you happen to be a Republican and your favorite member of Congress is being accused of harassment, you can't say, I don't believe those women, right? But then if a Democrat's being accused of it, you believe the women. <laughs> it's apolitical, as I've, as I've said. Um, and I think that it, we have to kind of come to terms with the fact that uh, we have to take politics out of it. And, and that's what I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times right after the election. And um, I, had my, I showed my kids the Access Hollywood tape because I wanted them to see how you don't treat a human being. And in the op-ed, I, I wrote that I felt that <clears throat> in our country, uh, a lot of people put policies over human decency. And um, for me, after what I've been through, I'm always going to choose human decency. But it's such a personal choice for, for every American. Um, and that's the way we hire and fire people in political office. Thank you for your question. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm not sure this is on. Uh, Go ahead. My name is Matthew. I'm also a Talk to the microphone. It's on? Not sure if it's on. Oh, yep. there we go. Okay, so you said that this is predominantly a male issue, uh, but what about the men who've also been sexually harassed in the mm -hmm. workplace? Yes, it, of course. I've uh, acknowledged and heard from uh, many men who have also gone through uh, similar situations. I would say predominantly it's women who face this, but we don't really know the true numbers because the truth of the matter is that only one in three women actually say that they've been harassed, but we know it's way more than that. Um, and 71% of the cases are never reported for obvious reasons because we see what happens when women do come forward. So I would imagine that the numbers for men are higher than I think what they say is maybe 5% now, but it's probably higher. And it, I'm not saying that it's only women who are victims, but it's predominantly women who are victims. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, because many women, they don't have the courage to speak up, what led and drove you, what internal values that you have drove you to file the suit against Roger Ailes? Because many other women don't have the courage to. Uh, so courage is not like a light switch that you just turn on one night. <laughs> Um, it's a building process, and I do think that the way in which I was raised play a part of it. Um, I had parents that told me daily that I could be whatever I wanted to be, and that built, built a lot of self-esteem and self-confidence in me and courage. Um, I think some of it is innate, too. I remember being in kindergarten and being put in the wrong group of kids who didn't know how to read, and I knew how to read, and I went up to the teacher three times on that first day of school and said, but I know how to read. And she kept poo-pooing me, right? And I went home and told my mom, and then the next day I was in the right group, but what if I hadn't done that? It could have changed my entire educational trajectory. 
So some of it, I think, is fire in the belly and, and innate. But here's what I've learned. Courage is contagious. And we're seeing that play out right now. That when you hand that gift of courage to one person, and they hand it to another, and to another, and to another, we end up in this collective experience that we're witnessing right now, where more and more women and men feel empowered to come forward. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Eiler. I'm a journalism student here as well. Um, my question for you more so refers to college campuses with Title IX. We see so many times that men and females um, that are going into internships or even dealing with professors and even women leadership on campus struggle to come forward when they're faced with sexual harassment or sexual assault. What do you say to them or to all of us that um, are going into the work field in only a couple of years and want to become women leaders, but we're afraid to um, go into this knowing that something like this could happen in a workplace in real life for our jobs? Mm -hmm. Well, I have great faith in your generation uh, because in this college campus tour that I've been doing, uh, women and men want to work together to solve this, especially young people. Uh, millennials are, are, are so good at working together for a common good. And I've had so many young people say to me that they want to work together to try and solve this. So I have great aspirations for young people being a part of this process. Um, listen, I think that sexual harassment should be a required course on college campuses. Um, because I think that in that way we prepare our young people for what they might face in the workplace, but also educate, again, our young men especially, about how to behave and, and what's acceptable. So that would be a first start is for young people on college campuses to ask for those kinds of courses. And I don't think you should be fearful about what you might face because you, you might not face it in the workplace. Um, if we continue to do all this work, I'm hoping to make it better for, for your generation. Um, but know that you have a voice. You know, a lot of young people who are already in the workplace, I've been encouraging them to form small groups in the workplace to just have open discussions and dialogue about these kinds of things that happen so it's not so secretive and it's not such a, you know, a, a bad thing to talk about. And in some cases, um, companies are actually being proactive. I know uh, at CBS, I just recently talked to some pals and they said their management has come to the, the group at large to say, you know, let's form committees, let's figure out what we can do, let's make sure this isn't going to happen here. Mm -hmm. You know, they had their Charlie Rose issue, we've got Matt Lauer issues, you know, these, these things where powerful men were, were brought down and now management is seeing, you know, this isn't, this isn't just a women issue, this is a big deal issue. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, it's a financial issue as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm encouraged, you know, and I think uh, to your, you know, with your question, I think that uh, being part of the solution is, mm -hmm. is a big part of it. Completely. Thank you. Yes. Too tall for that. Um, my name is Christian Warnell. I'm a journalism student here as well. Um, you mentioned the college tours, but I was curious, have you put any second thought into how you're going to change the narrative by adapting or adopting more programs and events into your already busy schedule to help do that? And if so, how? Going to more colleges, you mean? I'm like adding more events, more like other ideas, or even adding into that one of like how you're going to help change the narrative mm -hmm. to make it no longer just a women's issue as a men's and stretching it as a whole issue as, as it affects both parties. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm continuing to to speak up about it. I mean, I'm I'm basically on the road almost 24/7, um, doing events and then working on the hill and. My husband says to me, you know, you're a lot more busy than when you actually had a full-time job. <laughs> I have like six full-time jobs right now. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's about continuing to, to speak out on the issue. You know, I could have just gone home after my story and never said another word about it. But if there's been one constant in my life, it's been that when there's a challenge in front of me, I really I go for it. And so that's what I'm doing with this issue. Um, and I hope other people will help and, and join in because uh, I can't do it all by myself. You mentioned it was, you know, courage is contagious. So, you know, everything is kind of contagious. It's like, you know, hey, let's, let's build a stage, let's paint a fence, let's, uh, let's solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's not one woman who's going to fix this. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Hello, my name's Anthony, and I'm a, a political science major here at uh, Southern Creek University. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming out and speaking to us. And, 
uh, being at the fore of the issue. I, I could imagine, uh, as much as you've spoken about it in, in years past, I can't imagine it ever gets easier to, to talk about, so thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure how to necessarily word my question, so, so forgive me, but it comes from a place of curiosity and not cynicism. Um, how do we have uh, a conversation uh, about the juxtaposition, juxtaposition between um, – there was a document published last year uh, called the, the Media Men List. Uh, it started out as an anonymous document uh, for women to be able to speak silently, warning each other about uh, potential predators that are out there. But then ultimately it was, it was published, um, and a lot of the accusers continued to remain anonymous. Um, the juxtaposition I speak about is, uh, since we're in a school of journalism, yourself being a journalist, the verification process, you know, um, uh, running our, our sources through that. How do, we, how do we have a conversation about that without undermining some of the, the, the concerns or the, the accusations that get brought about? No, thank you. It's, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess what I would say to that is that the percentage of false reporting is tiny. And I believe that the majority of people coming forward are telling the truth. Um, I would also say that of all the thousands of women who reached out to me, their stories were so egregious that there was no gray area. Uh, just last year, a woman asked for a promotion and her boss asked her to get up on the desk and spread them. I mean, that's the kind of stories that I'm hearing of women reaching out to me. Um, so, of course, we need to go through a process and make sure that it's fair um, and that people are not falsely accused. But when I get asked the question, you know, do you think this movement has gone too far or, you know, it's a witch hunt or... I, I'm sorry to say that I think it's just beginning. Um, it really does need to trickle down to the every woman. And there are still hundreds and thousands of stories out there that haven't been told. Um, but you're right, we do, we do have to be very careful. And, and also, I think it's incredibly important to delineate between uh, the accusations of a Harvey Weinstein and actual rape, you know, and, for example, the accusations of Senator Al Franken. You know, it's, they're, they're different, right? And I think we have to be cognizant of that in, in the way in which we don't lump them all together. So, um, you know, thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely an important, it's an important step so that we don't falsely accuse people as well. Thank you very much. Do you think um, it was right for Franken to resign? Uh, you know, I was sharing with you that uh, I was uh, uh, filming a documentary uh, uh, Norman Lear and his show called America Divided uh, was following me for three months during my mission on Capitol Hill, and it happened to be during that whole time. And so we captured in real time. Al, Al Franken was actually the first sponsor of my bill. Uh, he's from Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. And we were documenting in real time how then he's accused and, and how he can no longer be the co-sponsor of my bill, and, um, and then he has to resign. You know. Um, I think that when there's more than one person accusing, then that becomes an issue, yes. Um, so I, I, you know, I think when there's one person who comes forward, the way that I've always looked at all these stories is, okay, well, there's, there's bound to be more. Mm -hmm. uh, because it often doesn't just happen one time. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, but I do think, I do think it's important to, that's why I bring him up, because I think it's important to note that that is a totally different scenario than what Harvey Weinstein was up to, allegedly. Right, right. Yes. Hi, I'm David. I study math, so I know nothing really about journalism. I'm not here for <laughs> extra credit. Um, but I guess that's good. I love math. <laughs> yeah, so go math. Um, before I get started, I just want to give a shout out. I'm a big fan of your husband and uh, both of you. I think you both uh, oh, have great careers. Thanks. Um, but I had a policy question. So the New York State Senate, the Republican majority Senate, just passed a bill sort of similar to what you were talking about on a federal level, um, but the Assembly hasn't passed that. Are you familiar with that at all? Or are you I heard rumblings about it. It was just the other day, right? 
Yeah, a, few, a couple weeks ago. Okay. Um, so the Senate did pass something like that. Uh, do you think that those initiatives in the state level are worthwhile or yes. superior to the federal level at all? Or do you have any comments about that? No, no, no. It's incredibly important um, at, the, at the local and the state level as well. Uh, first of all, because it protects people in, in your local um, community and your, and your actual state. But it also forces uh, the folks on the federal level to, to pay attention to what they're doing at the state level. Next month, I'll be out in California helping them try to work on passing their legislation with, with regard to forced arbitration as well. So yes, um, the, the, state, the state issues are incredibly important. And I'm happy to know that, that New York did that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Hi. Uh, you hear me? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anthony Vertucci. I'm a graduate of the School of Journalism, currently a grad student in the Higher Education Administration program, and I'm working in the Marketing and Communications Department right now. So um, this is more of, I guess, a personal question. I'm a new father. My daughter is 20 months old. Hmm. What kind of advice could you give to me as hmm. a man who's, you know, wants to protect my daughter and wants her to grow up in a world that I believe will be a lot better in 15, 20 years, you know, hmm. but I want to well, thank you. Thank you for, for that question. Um, I think that I would encourage you to raise her, telling her she can be whatever she wants to be, but also um, to not feel like she has to abide by the social norms of girls always have to be nice. <laughs> I say that a lot on college campuses. Stop being so damn nice. <laughs> The more of us that decide we're going to do that, then we change that interpretation of when you go to ask for a raise, you're not a B, you know, you're actually seen as aggressive, just like men are when they ask for a raise. Um, and I would just also encourage you to encourage her to take little risks along the way, because oftentimes girls are, are also socialized to sort of play by the rules. And I think it's really important to step out of your comfort zone, because even though it's uncomfortable in the moment, you realize that by taking that small risk and achieving it, that you build your self-confidence even more so. Um, and you build up all those little risks, and before you know it, you're feeling really powerful and confident. So I think girls especially have to be more of uh, risk takers uh, along the way. So good luck. Thank you so much. Thanks. OK, we have two more? Two more. So go ahead. This one. Go ahead. Thank you so much for bringing your courage here tonight. I have a question about HR. I remember when I started at my first real big girl job, I, there was three days of really interactive things from HR about sexual harassment in the workplace, and they made me really believe that they were there for me. Mm. And then when I had an interaction with a superior where I felt very uncomfortable and not sexually harassed, but harassed, uh, I felt that there was a total wall went up and they had absolutely no support and had no interest in what I had to say. Mm -hmm. You spoke before about a 12-step plan. Can you just speak briefly about your advice to, to, to going at HR and mm -hmm. how that works? Yeah, I talk a lot about it in, in the book uh, mm -hmm. because I, I believe that there's an inherent conflict of interest with human resources handling these kinds of complaints uh, because you have to keep in mind who's signing the paycheck. And oftentimes it can be the harasser. Uh, I had one woman reach out to me to say that, that when she went to HR, she found out that the HR person was having an affair with her harasser. <laughs> uh, so that's a huge problem. Uh, you think? So I actually advocate in the book for uh, companies to step outside of the box, take a risk, where's my young father, um, and, and hire ombudsmen or some sort of an independent contractor to handle these types of complaints and also make complaints available to go to more people than just one person in HR um, to make it a safer environment. Listen, I've heard from a lot of great HR people, so this is not a knock on them. It's just that I, I feel like there is this, this conflict. And the same week that I spoke to that all-boys school, I also spoke to my first HR convention. And that's also where I should be spending a lot of time. And it was very brave of this association to bring me in because they realized that even though there are laws on the books, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to learn from me what can we do to make it a safer environment. The reason that I think they put up, you know, they're, they're really there to protect the company, right. not necessarily the individual. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that's also going to change in this process. And, and you so. know, there might be supervisors that you can trust. You know, if it's, it's not always, oh, I have something I'm going to go to HR with, and then you're talking to a stranger you, you've never met. 
you know, it's one of the reasons why mentoring at, at workplaces and getting uh, relationships with people who, you know, are a little bit higher up, who you can trust and, and go to, and maybe they have a louder voice that they can help change things. Mm -hmm. So relationships like that can sometimes help as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay. Hi. Um, I, I think we only have time for one more. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Gurnoor and I'm a journalism minor here. So my question is going to be kind of a long one. Mm -hmm. I come from <laughs> India and it's, it's a country where rape and sexual assault has been normalized to the extent where leaders have come up and said, you are a woman, you are a girl, and you will be raped. It's inevitable. And it's happening to girls who are newborn, two months old, 50 years old, the age does not matter. And your families are hushing you up, saying, hush, hush, you're going to ruin the family's honor by telling everybody that you were raped or you were assaulted. What would you say to these women who not even who have human rights on paper, but they're not being given their rights? Mm -hmm. I know I've heard this a lot as I travel across the country, that, that in other countries it's actually a worse situation than we have in the United States. Um, and I do think that the one thing that might help to start solving that is social media. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's an outlet where people can be anonymous or not, and you can band together. I mean, as much as I hate social media for my preteen kids, <laughs> I, I, I think it has fueled this entire movement, um, and it's made women, women feel safe to come forward. I mean, your, your problem is, sounds like an insurmountable task. Um, to change cultural beliefs in an entire society is, is, is a daunting task. Um, but I would encourage them to, to hear about our movement here and, and know that their voice matters. Definitely. Yeah, thank so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>